Our call to community this morning will be done as a responsive reading. Please read the parts on the screen that are in black. You are welcome here. If you are straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, intersexual, demisexual, pansexual, or asexual, or resist labels completely, you are whole and welcome here. If you are transgender, non-binary, genderqueer, or cisgender, you are whole and welcome here. If you are confused about your sexuality, have questions, struggle in an intimate relationship, or struggle because you aren't in one, you are whole and welcome here. If you have had an abortion or an unintended pregnancy, given up a child, had a miscarriage, have AIDS or HIV, struggle with infertility or sexual dysfunction, you are whole and welcome here. If you have been the victim of sexual abuse, sexual harassment, or sexual assault, you are whole and welcome here. If you have made sexual decisions or had behaviors that you regret, you are welcome here and we will help you offer restorative justice and healing. Your sexuality is holy and sacred and an integral part of who you are. You are whole and welcome here. As Unitarian Universalists, we will side with you, love you, and fight for your rights. We seek to create a world where sexuality and sexual diversity is celebrated with holiness and integrity. Candles have been used during worship to express many sentiments. Please feel free to light a candle while the prelude plays for any joys or sorrows you may be experiencing in your life or as a remembrance of others. Please stand in body or spirit for our chalice lighting and spoken affirmation. We light this chalice for the inherent worth and dignity of every individual. As Unitarian Universalist, we will side with you, love you, and fight for your rights. Join me as together we remind ourselves of the affirmation that is a cornerstone of our free faith tradition. The words, should you need them, are in the morning program. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom, to help one another. You may be seated.
Our opening thought is from learning, Learn to Tell Your Story by Kelly Clement. My most impactful life decisions in chronological order, to have abortions when I needed them, to get sober, to give birth to our child. If each life is precious, then so is mine, so is theirs, so is yours. I am not ashamed, nor do I regret my abortions. Rather, I am grateful for access to abortion care, professional and compassionate providers, the opportunity to captain my own ship. What I wish for all of us, and especially for their generation, robust reproductive justice, health, and freedom without stigma or restriction, an end to heteronormative, patriarchal, white supremacy culture, love and liberation in abundance. Many of our elements today will be on video and will transition without always having words from me. Okay, so one of the things that I love most about being a Unitarian Universalist is our principles. And in particular, what I love about them is that although within each of our principles, there is a specificity, so we can understand exactly to what they're referring, I also like that they're able to create this general sense of expectation of covenant for what a UU should be fighting for and thinking and considering when we're sort of making our decisions on political and moral and any issue like that. Um, and for me, when I look at all of our seven principles together with all our discussions of interdependent webs of existence and valuing democracy and things like this, I really get the sense that UUism wants us to trust in humans and to trust in the human ability to be rational and to make choices that are right for them and their neighbors and their community. And I think the way that that ties into abortion is really this sense of bodily autonomy and of trusting pregnant people to understand what is the right choice for them in their life. Um, so if that choice is terminating the pregnancy, then we need to trust them. And I think that's what UUism tells us about this issue. And if they choose to carry to term and keep the child or carry to term and adopt it out, those are also equally valid choices that we need to trust them to be able to make because you know, as we say, my body, my choice. Um, growing up as someone who can get pregnant and potentially will at some point in my life, that's how I would like people to think about me and the way that I'm allowed to exist in this world and exist in my body is to trust me to do what's right, just like I trust other people to do what's right for their body. And I really think the issue of abortion can be as simple as that. It's trusting someone to make a choice that's appropriate for them and to decide whether this living creature is allowed to use their body, essentially. I, I can mention that old uh, example that people use with kidney donation. So for example, if tomorrow I woke up and I realized that my sibling needed a kidney, even if I knew that I could give them my kidney to save their life, that does not mean that I have to. I'm not compelled to do that because they're not entitled to the use of my body. And society and our laws and our morality trusts me to decide what is appropriate for my life and whether I'm going to allow someone to have use of my body. Um, and I think that's very similar to abortion. So. Yes, I think that's what UUism to me says about abortion. That's what I say about abortion. And I would just like everyone to consider that when they're thinking about this in the future. Some folks believe a life begins when egg meets sperm. 
are so pregnant women could carry the term, but their actions point to something that you wouldn't expect, that they think it's only matter when they're not born yet. They'll make sure family leave and childcare funding fails, take away their parents at the border and jail, kids beg for climate action under crippling debt, while you show them they practice for this morning is a prayer for our elected officials. Spirit of love and justice, be with us today in all ways. Join me in contemplation of these words for our practices. We take to the streets, we write letters, we sing and worship and gather in community. Remind us that our gatherings are sacred because you are there. Spirit of love and justice, be with our elected officials today in all ways. In the difficult work they are called to do, in the choices they must make, in the lives that they change, remind them that the work they do is sacred, filled with opportunities to bring more love and justice into the world. Spirit of love and justice, we know that life is complicated and that no choice is easy and without repercussions. We know that the complexities of this world is what brings us together as people in sacred community so that we may better know and remember the love and justice that guide our footsteps. We are grateful for the choices we can make, for the freedom and dignity and life-giving power that we claim when each of us makes a choice that is right for us. Sometimes you whisper in our ears, Spirit, and sometimes we hear the roar of your presence in the voices of people raised in witness. You make yourself available to every one of us, and we gather in prayer today to ask you to be with us and with everyone we meet. May every one of us and every one of our elected officials hear and heed your cries, spirit of love and justice. May we be grateful for the complicated choices that each of us have to make and recognize that those choices are not only opportunities to bring in more love and more justice into our world, but that those choices are the products of justice in our world, that discernment and conscience are sacred rights bestowed to each of us. May we and our elected officials live fully in these gifts of choice and sacred discernment, and may they always be used to sustain more love and more justice. Amen.
But I used to work as a chaplain at a hospital outside of Buffalo. And one time I was in the ICU and I met a woman who was in deep spiritual pain. She was very sick and she was racked with guilt about something she had done 45 years before. 45 years before, she and her boyfriend got pregnant and he asked her to get an abortion and she did. Now, decades later, as she faced her own mortality, she was afraid that she had done something so terrible that God would not welcome her to heaven. Well, one of the core practices of good chaplaincy is working with the patient's theology, not mine. So I asked her about her understanding of God. And she said things, but one of the things she said is that God is love. And that gave me an opening. I talked to her about how my understanding of God is that God is loving, non-judgmental. God understood how people made hard decisions and sometimes mistakes. She seemed to hear that and we prayed together and she was much more at peace by the time I left her. But I was shaking my head as I walked back to my office. The poor woman was so sick and she was spending so much energy thinking about a decision that she made under duress 45 years before. And the source of her anguish was a religious teaching, a religious teaching that created an intense stigma for her. There is a truth that despite the, the general idea of what religions talk, how religions talk about abortion, there's actually much more nuance in religious teachings about reproductive choice. And I wanna take this opportunity to walk through some of the teachings of some of the major traditions to show just how they think about reproductive choice. And we'll start close to home with Christianity. This of course is the source of that Unitarian Universalism comes out of, but we've since become so much more than Christianity. Christianity's sacred text is the Bible and there are two biblical references that have been used by those opposed to contraception and abortion. Psalm 139, 13, and Jeremiah 1, 5. In the first one, the Psalm reads, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Similarly, Jeremiah reads, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. However, Christians usually have not heard the texts that assume a fetus is not a person. Specifically, Exodus 21 describes a situation in which a pregnant woman who intervenes in a fight between two men when she is injured and suffers a miscarriage as a result. And the penalty for that is the payment of a fine. And that would not have been possible if a human life had been taken. In Numbers, the book of Numbers, a husband who suspects his wife has committed adultery can take her to the priests. They will make her take a potion that, if she is guilty, will make her womb discharge and her uterus drop. If she is not guilty, then she shall be immune and able to conceive children. Hmm. You know, as usual, the Bible is full of gems of wisdom and ethical teachings. And it's also a hot mess that contradicts itself over and over. And we see that in the many different flavors of Christianity. You know, progressive Protestant traditions preach the right of a woman to make the best decision as she sees it. While uh, some evangelical sects and the Catholic Church take a hard line against any ability of a woman to choose for herself. The Catholic position on abortion and contraception is especially problematic Problematic not just because their teachings deny women the ability to make choices about their health care and deny couples the ability to make choices about planning their families. They are problematic because the Catholic Church is aggressive about lobbying the government to make Catholic theologies the law of the land. That is, imposing those Catholic beliefs on everyone, 
whether they are Catholic or not Catholic. It's so dangerous and so contrary to the spirit of separation of church and state. However, the Catholics, all people who are practicing Catholics are not a monolith. There's an organization called Catholics for Choice that is advocating for changes on these theologies from within. And by the by, two Fridays ago, First Unitarian hosted a celebration for Father Anne Trapiano, a woman who just got ordained as a Catholic priest via the Women's Ordination Conference. And I'm so delighted for her and her vision of a more inclusive and accountable Roman Catholic Church. And I imagine that if women could be priests and be in leadership in the mainstream Roman Catholic Church, the teachings of that church on reproductive freedom would be very different. For Judaism, the position on abortion is pretty clear. The legal codes and rabbinical teachings tend to depict the fetus as part of a woman's body. However, just as one may not wantonly mutilate one's own body, so too a woman is not permitted to obtain an abortion merely for reasons of convenience. But just as she's permitted to sacrifice a portion of her own body for her greater good, so too may she obtain permission for an abortion in order to assure her overall well-being. In Jewish tradition, the fetus is not a person. It has no rights. So abortion is permissible under a wide variety of circumstances. All four non-Orthodox Jewish movements, Reform, Reconstructionist, Conservative, and Humanist, are on the record as opposing any governmental regulation of abortion. Buddhism faces the fact that abortion may sometimes be the best decision and a truly moral choice. For Buddhists, that doesn't mean that there's nothing troubling about abortion, but it does mean that Buddhists may understand the complexity, the, that reproductive decisions are part of the moral complexity of life. So here's a statement from the Japanese American Buddhist Churches of America. It is the woman carrying the fetus and no one else who must in the end make this most difficult decision and live with it for the rest of her life. As Buddhists, we can only encourage her to make a decision that is both thoughtful and compassionate. On to Islam. There is a consensus among Muslims that abortion is allowed if the life of the woman is endangered at any period during the pregnancy. Some scholars have now taken the position that the fetus is to be treated as a person from the moment of conception, but that is actually, a, so that would, have, that would forbid any abortion, but this actually contradicts the classical Islamic practice in which the fetus was never seen as a legal person before birth. In the Quran, Surah 46 and line 15, and surahs are the word for individual chapters of the Quran, 4615, it says, we have enjoyed, um, enjoined on man kindness to his parents. In pain did his mother bear him, and in pain did she give him birth. This interpretation of some, the interpretation of some Islamic scholars is that God has singled out the, the woman for mention when speaking of the duties of a person towards his parents, that that shows that her pain must be taken into consideration first and foremost. And the final decision about bringing a child into the world must be hers. Throughout all these traditions, the various religions seem to imply that they wish no abortions would happen. That feels like adding a stigma that doesn't help. Similarly, I've heard people imply that every abortion is a gut-wrenching decision. But I've spoken with and read of many women for whom it was a very easy decision, an obvious no-brainer. Perhaps you've heard politicians say that abortion should be safe and legal and rare. That rare is a weird tempt, attempt to hedge their opinions, and I, and I think it's not necessary. Abortion is okay. Similarly, there's a lot of hand-wringing about late, later term abortions. And again, I think that's a way of not saying the full truth. That is that an abortion is the decision of the woman and only the woman. 
during his run for president, Peter Buttigieg, who was raised Catholic and now is now Episcopalian, was asked about third trimester abortions. And I thought his answer showed real integrity. Here's what he said. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of a woman in that situation, meaning having a late term abortion. If it's that late in your abortion, in your pregnancy, then almost by definition, you've been expecting to carry it to term. We're talking about women who have perhaps chosen a name, women who purchased the crib, families that then get the most devastating medical news of their lifetime. Something about the health or life of the mother or the viability of the pregnancy that forces them to make an impossible, unthinkable choice. And the bottom line is that as horrible as that choice is, that woman, that family may seek spiritual guidance, they may seek, seek medical guidance, but that decision is not going to be made any better medical or medically or morally because the government is dictating how the decision should be made. So where is Unitarian Universalism in all this? In 2015, the UUA voted to affirm a statement of conscience on reproductive justice. It's long and you can find it on the UUA website, but I want to talk and actually read a couple of excerpts from that statement. First goes, the world we envision includes social, political, legal, and economic systems that support everyone's freedom of reproductive choice and expression of gender identity and sexuality, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized. In such a world, all communities are places of equality, abundance, and safety free from violence, oppression, and hazardous environments. This world includes access to safe, affordable, and culturally and developmentally appropriate childcare and healthcare. In our vision, everyone has access to accurate information about sexuality and family planning and safe, healthy, and culturally sensitive reproductive health services. And the next section I wanna read is, is from the section on the theological grounding for this position of the UUA. Unitarian Universalists support gender equality, positive sexuality, diverse sexual expression, and the individual's right to make reproductive choices. Such choices are influenced by social and political systems, as well as by factors such as racial cultural identity, economic status, immigration citizenship status, relationship with the justice system, health status, and ability. Our religious tradition directs us to respect the diversity of faith traditions that surround us and insists that no singular religious viewpoint or creed guide the policies of our government. Preach. Our pluralistic congregations include diverse beliefs, backgrounds, and personal stories, yet we unite in striving to live out the values and principles that call us to work for reproductive justice in spite of the complexities of the issues. That's the end of the quote. That statement of conscience is inspiring, but it's also a leaping off point, just a leaping off point. And it points the way and we Unitarian Universalists must follow that way. So earlier this month, First Unitarian sponsored a public reading of the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision. And you'd think that listening to a legal decision might be a little boring, but the folks who attended agreed that it was compelling, and full of fascinating insights. Now we collaborated with the New Mexico Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, and I am a big friend, a big fan of the New Mexico RCRC. If you're interested in doing more, the RCRC offers a variety of ways to support the cause. Of course, you can make a donation. You know how it is with money. It's always the right color. But you can also give your time. For example, you can be a legal observer. Legal observers are especially trained to monitor abortion provider clinics for activities that violate the Freedom of Access to Clinical Entrances Act. You can be an advocacy volunteer. They're looking for activists interested in phone banking, data entry, writing personal notes to patients, and making safe sex kits all through New Mexico. 
And you can be a driver for patients. Our volunteer drivers are providing transportation for patients coming to New Mexico for abortion access, coming from places such as Texas, for example. But back to the positions of different faiths on abortion. When we consider the, the persuasiveness of these religious teachings, we should consider the values behind them. What is valued? Who is valued? And who is considered disposable? Ultimately, where does this theology take us? To help answer these questions, I want to share a quote from James Baldwin. It is not too much to say that whoever wishes to become a truly moral human being must first divorce themselves from all the prohibitions, crimes, and hypocrisies of the Christian church. If the concept of God has any validity or use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, and more loving. If God cannot do this, then it is time that we got rid of him. Baldwin's critique focuses on Christianity, but I think it applies to any religion. So religion does not make us larger, freer, more loving. We should get rid of it. So whether a person can make a religious argument for or against, for or against reproductive freedom really depends on whether or not that religion that the person is using for the argument is patriarchal or not. And here's an easy way to tell if a religion is patriarchal. If the religion refers to God as him, it's patriarchal. Ultimately, I think religious debates about reproductive choice are about patriarchy. A patriarchy, for folks who don't know, it's, it's sort of a jargony thing, but that is the legal, institutional, and cultural systems that give power to men and oppress women. Women are told what to do all the time. Women are told what to wear all the time. And they're told what to think all the time. The last thing they need is to be told what to do with their bodies. Women fight for control of their lives every day, every single day. And this is the result of patriarchy, patriarchy that's shored up by a lot of religion. I think it's the work of Unitarian Universalism to help us be larger, freer, and more loving. So let's dismantle the patriarchy, fight for reproductive choice. So be it, and blessed be. Giving is a spiritual practice that reminds us of what we have to share. Sometimes it is fun, sometimes it is time. Both are gratefully received. The bowl awaits, or you may donate on the church app.
Hello, you, you, hey. I'm going to sing a song with you called Shine On Me. It's an amazing spiritual that anybody can sing. And in these days when the things that we're dealing with, the feeling separate and all of that, and things seem so hard, this is one of those songs that you just throw your head back, put it in your medicine kit. All you have to do is ask. And here's how it goes. Shine on me, oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me, oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Lift me up, oh, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Yes, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Oh, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. Let the light. From the light, from the lighthouse, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. So hold me close. Let the light from the lighthouse hold me close. So shine. Shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light. From the lighthouse, shine All you have to do is just ask. The light is always there. Our practice this morning invoking the spirit of love and justice reminded me of something a friend, the Reverend Mark Sandlin, said recently, justice is love in action. We Unitarian Universalists, who have long been known to be a bit too much in our heads, have been moving towards a more authentic recognition of our bodies, a more genuine relationship with our bodies and in our bodies, Hallelujah and blessed be. These bodies, these bodies, our homes, these bodies, our being, these bodies without which we can neither have inherent worth nor recognize it in others, these bodies without which we cannot experience the interdependent web of all existence, for it is through our bodies that we are a part of the selfsame web. 
Let us pledge ourselves, the whole of ourselves, to the great collective liberation of all bodies. Let us pledge ourselves, the whole of ourselves, to do all that we can to protect against gendered violence against our bodies, known and unknown, near and far, stranger or friend. Let us pledge ourselves, the whole of ourselves, to inhabit these bodies, to honor these bodies, to celebrate these bodies, to defend these bodies. So be it. See to it. Amen. Seek for the spirit of life that is within you, that you might know more fully its power and strength. Seek for the spirit of life that surrounds you, that you might know more fully its connection to you. Seek for the spirit of life that is within others, that you might more enter more fully into the community that embraces us this day and every day. Please join me in saying the words to extinguish our chalice. The words are in the morning program. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.